adjacent to laneway 8 uh, in the report. That's number 39. As a consequence, there may be a perception that Harley's impartiality on the matter may be affected. Councillor Harley declares that she will consider this matter on its merits and vote accordingly. I have another declaration of interest affecting impartiality from Councillor Gondoshevsky in relation to item 5.1. The extent of Councillor Gondoshevsky's interest is that she is an acquaintance with the applicant, Mr. Joe Churas Chindasi, Chindasi of Chindasi Architects. Councillor Gondoshevsky de declares that there may be a perception that her impartiality in the matter may be affected and declares that she will consider this matter on its merits and vote accordingly. The last disclosure is from Councillor Loden in relation to item 5.5. The extent of the interest is that Councillor Loden has a personal association with one of the affected residents through Councillor Loden's involvement in the fathering project. As a consequence, there may be a perception that Councillor Loden's impartiality on the matter may be affected. Councillor Loden declares that he will consider this matter on its merits and vote accordingly. Thank you. Thank you, CEO. Um, before we go through the items, um, I just wanted to note that there have been a few items that have been withdrawn, just for the benefit of the public gallery and councillors who may not have seen some very late emails coming through. Um, item 5.2 has been withdrawn by the applicant. That was a change of use on Car Place in Leaderville. Um, item 5.6, amendment to the MHI uh, number 3 Mignonette Street. That has been withdrawn by administration and should be back on the March um, agenda. And previous to that and some time ago, um, we've also had 8.3 um, draft banks reserve master plan withdrawn to um, come back next month and also the late report on the West Australian Football Commission JLT series fixture at Leaderville Oval has been withdrawn. So I now move through the agenda and take questions um, from council members. Um, so the first item is 5.1, number 118 Ango Street, North Perth, mixed use development comprising one commercial tenancy and four multiple dwellings. Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you. Uh, questions through you to the Director. Uh, welcome back of uh, Development Services. Uh, the City has a policy 7.6.1 which is our heritage uh, management policy which is development guidelines for heritage and adjacent properties. Uh, it seems there's been some concerns raised from the neighbour to the east in relation to the way that the property addresses uh, the heritage listed property. Well, I presume that's where it's come from. Um, the response, the officer's technical comments refer to the R codes in the city's built form policy in terms of uh, the parapet wall, uh, or the uh, wall in particular, the, the parapet wall, but also the, uh, the lack of setbacks. When I look at the, well, I guess my first question is, I can't see it listed in the report, but has the has the development been assessed against that policy as an adjacent uh, development? Yes, through you, Mayor Cole, I did speak to the officer about that today, and it has been reviewed, but it's not reflected in the report, so we'll add that into the report between now and next week. All right, so specifically, uh, the, the three elements, the performance criteria listed for adjacent properties is one, the new development maintains and enhances existing views and vistas, uh, to the principal facade and that uh, the acceptable development is uh, that the setback is equivalent or no less than the adjacent heritage listed place. The second is uh, it maintains and uh, enhances the visual prominence and it talks about not, not imitating or replicating the styles um, and being clearly distinguishable. Um, that's obviously something that needs to be commented on uh, within the report. But the scale and mass that respects the adjacent heritage listed place, the acceptable de development is that side setbacks of new development reflect those of the adjacent heritage listed place. That's something that doesn't appear to be the case but hasn't been addressed because it's been assessed against the built form policy, not the, uh, not, uh, the heritage policy. Uh, and then also uh, specific comments about, because there's clearly concern in relation uh, from the community feedback, there's concern in relation to how the, pro the um, the third story in particular addresses the heritage building. Um, I understand that the, the design of the roof and the, um, the ansiding, I suppose, of the, the roof does uh, provide an increased setback, but just if we can get some comments in the, um, 
in the response in relation to that policy, that would be appreciated. Yes, through you, Mayor Cole, uh, we'll provide that in the report itself and the briefing notes as well. I just note on the in relation to the setback between the uh, the side setback between the existing heritage building and the boundary, uh, that was considered, and the setback isn't as great for this development, but it is quite similar. So that was um, that was where the officer's assessment landed. That obviously needs to be reflected in the report for council to consider. So we'll provide that information. Councillors, Councillor Lowden. Uh, two questions through the Chair to the Director of Development Services. Uh, firstly, um, the conditions under 10.1, the landscaping plan, uh, refers to an 80% canopy requirement for the side setback. Should that be side and rear setback? Through you, Mayor Cole, my understanding is that the policy requires it for side setbacks. Um, the rear setback is to a street, so it doesn't apply to the rear setbacks. But I'll go and check that again, um, given I haven't been here for a while, so to make sure that I'm not providing the wrong advice. And we'll put that in the briefing notes as well. And then my second one is probably um, a bit broader than this, but my understanding was the built form policy was coming back about now. Um, I thought it was actually coming to this briefing. Do you know when the built form updated built form policy is coming? Through you, Mayor Cole. I fortunately have the manager of... Uh policy in place here who can answer that question for us. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, um, we intend intended to bring the built form policy amendment one back to council in March. Um, however, on Friday it was announced by the state government that there's a release date for Design WA, which is the uh, 18th of February from memory. So um, we're now reconsidering the best approach forward and we'll provide further details on that to council members soon. Councillors. Councillor Hallett. Uh, through the Mayor to the Director of Development Services. Um, the report referred to the development achieving design excellence and it's got um, some minutes from the DRP um, meetings. Um, just wondering if you could provide perhaps in the briefing notes some explanation of what criteria and parameters resulted in that and whether it's just that they've addressed all of the comments from the, the panel or whether there's something else. Yes, through you, Mayor Cole, we can certainly provide that in the briefing notes. Um, essentially, the basis for design excellence is achieving the seven objectives, I think it is from memory, set out in the built form policy. Um, so that's essentially the, the basis for it. The minutes um, and the comments that are requested from the design review panel are set up based on those objectives. So the panel provides comments against each of those objectives. So that's the basis for it, and we'll explain that in the briefing notes. Councillors, um, Director, I have a question. Um, in the report where it's talking about the plot ratio um, being um, higher than um, under the policy, it talks about the fact that there are three storeys in lieu of a permitted four storeys. Just unsure about that, given the R60 zoning. Is that because it's in a mixed use area? Yes, through Mayor Cole, it's because of the built form policy area that applies to that site as opposed to the, the R code. Thank you. Councillors, any further questions on this item? Okay, we'll move on to item five. Oh, sorry, I have had a request whether we could go to item 7.7 .7 because we do have Mr Chris Leversidge here who was the independent consultant who conducted the ward review. So if you can please bear with me, we'll just go to item 7.7. .7. Um, statutory review of the city's wards and representation consideration of submissions. Are there any questions on this item? Are you just taking time to get to the page or does that mean there are no questions? It doesn't look like we have any questions. No? Okay. All right, go ahead, Councillor Harley. Okay. Yeah, maybe email would be great. Okay. Any other councillors have questions for the consultant while he's here? Let's we'll let him go home. Okay. Make it worth his while. You know, well, in part. Uh, um, so, 
And I'm, I'm not overly familiar with the process, but it seemed whilst there was a small, relative to the size of the uh, electorate, there was a relatively small number of submissions that did seem to be quite detailed and quite specific. Just, I guess, as a curiosity as to whether that is uh, usual or typical of, of, uh, of responses to uh, or people who are quite specific about how they felt uh, we should proceed. Um, it's something that uh, yeah, I, I, was, I was a little bit surprised to see it, but I, I guess I'd seek some feedback from you. It's obviously familiar with this process as to whether the number of responses and the, uh, the I suppose, the, the thoughts behind their submissions were was typical or something that is particular to Vincent. Um, through you, Mayor, it's not unusual to get few responses to these types of reviews, particularly if things are perceived to be operating well, and I think that's the case with Vincent. You didn't get a huge number of reviews. You did a pretty good advertising process, calling for submissions. I think your discussion paper was reasonably well developed and there are extra examples put in there to help provoke debate. Um, the diversity of responses is a little unusual, but having listened to some of the comments um, just now on a couple of planning items, I think your community is fairly well engaged in what they want to see happen and directions they'd like to see you take. So from that perspective, there are a few gems in there that you might have a look at as, as perhaps separate to the wards review. Any further questions for Chris? Thank you for your attendance this evening. Thank you, Much Mayor. appreciated. Um, I do have a question just from administration. I was just wanting to ask whether the discussion paper could be attached to the report. Through you, Mayor Cole, yes, we'll attach that for the meeting. Thank you for that. Okay, we'll move on. We'll go back to planning. So we were at item 5.3, number 5, Scott Street, Leaderville, two grouped dwellings. Any questions in relation to this one? Um, I did have a question, Director. I wondered if it was possible to have a um, revised overshadowing diagram showing the difference between what was proposed at the last council meeting versus the current proposal before us. Yes, through you, Mayor Cole, we can provide that. Thank you. Any further questions? Okay, item 5.4, um, numbers 4 to 10 Cow Street and numbers 199 to 241 Fitzgerald Street, West Perth, local development plan. Council Loden. Uh, just to follow up the question raised from the gallery around uh, a wetlands heritage trail of how was, was that considered as part of this um, and was there an op is there an opportunity to create a new objective to support a wetlands heritage trail? Through you, Mayor Cole, um, we'll need to speak to the applicant about that in the first instance, um, and we can provide a response in the in the briefing notes. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. We'll also I'll also review the submission um, that was mentioned by um, Chris and during the question time, so to ensure that those issues are all addressed. Councillors, Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you. A uh, couple of questions. One's, uh, I suppose, of, of a um, more serious nature, and that is just uh, the massing that's shown doesn't really address, and I know that it's indicative, but doesn't really address uh, northern or access to northern light. Into uh, it effectively creates two U shapes, um, but most of those U's face west, which means that the um, the solar access that is proposed by the massing would actually be. Uh, quite a poor outcome for future occupants. So I'd, just whether that has been considered, uh, most of the massing is to the north. Um, I'm looking at uh, attachment to page 241 of the agenda. Um, it seems to be uh, very difficult to get any northern light into any of the southern properties because the, the greatest height is effectively taking up all of the northern boundary. So that's something that is, uh, I guess, of concern. And whilst these, these are only indicative, the question is whether that has been considered and uh, what would be the appropriate steps uh, to, to have that potentially reviewed. So that's one question or comment, I suppose. And the other is, given the likely uh, longevity of the document, is it possible or cheeky to perhaps ask the submitters to reconsider the images that they've provided that they've taken on probably the wettest and ugliest day 
possible and it looks quite like quite a dreary looking landscape and perhaps they could go out there on a bit brighter day and provide some perspectives that actually uh, give people an, an idea of what the area looks like. Yes, Sir Mayor Cole, we can consider those things and I'll provide um, responses in the briefing notes once spe speaking to the applicant. Councillors? Um, my questions relate to the nil sit back on the rear edge um, adjoining non-residential and the area adjoining residential built form. Um, my question relates to the car park. Um, there's a, a laneway and then a car park which is council owned and there's a Bot J Club on it. And um, given that essentially will become a kind of a building lot, even more so um, piece of land, and there's been a lot of um, attention on that particular car park over the last four years or so. My question to the city is has there been any consideration of what the future use of that car park could be long term um, and how a nil setback on both the rear adjoining residential and non-residential would affect any future options the council may wish to look at, which may, please don't quote me, I'm not suggesting this, but which may at some future point in, a, in another council may mean developing that land um, whether it's for um, public use or for private use. So that is my um, concern and the question I'd like administration to address. Through you, Mayor Cole, I guess the first thing to point out is that there's a right of way that um, adjoins the northern portion of the LDP. So the setback, the nil setback proposed for the first four storeys, um, I don't consider will have a significant impact on the car park to the north as a result. Um, the southern portion of the car park will have that nil setback. Um, and the question about the, well, it's not considered to have an impact on the car park and the current use. Um, we haven't assessed um, as an organisation whether or not there would be a significant impact on the development potential of that site as a result of uh, that nil setback. Um, we don't have any plans at the moment to redevelop the car park into something else. Um, and on that basis, we consider the setback was appropriate. Sorry, just a um, subsidiary question. So may I ask that the administration um, look at this in particular? So this is a strategic um, land asset for the city um, and um, the decisions we make on this proposal before us may well limit um, any future options that the city may wish to see. So I would ask um, that the city come back to the council next week um, or, or, or that this matter be deferred for a later discussion, but that the city come back um, to council with um, a, a more finessed answer. Um, for the record, I'm aware it doesn't affect the car park. I'm very, very familiar with that particular um, part, of our, part of our assets. Sorry, through, if I may, through you, Mayor Cole, um, we can provide some more information on that matter. Uh, just to clarify, this is a an application, a planning application to be made just like a development application. So um, councils required to consider it in accordance with the regulations. Um, if it, it's not like a policy is where it's council's um, policy document and has the full discretion whether or not to proceed or not, um, this is a, a a application that's been made and needs to be considered the same as a development application would need to be made. So just, just to clarify that, we can provide that information as requested. Thank you, Director. I'm, I'm aware of all that. Thank you. Um, Director, that was also a similar question to what I was going to ask. I do think that in planning matters we always um, consult with landowners that are neighbours and that being us in this circumstance, my question is um, should we seek the advice of another directorate such as corporate services um, with the landowner hat on to look at um, what implication this may or may not have on a city asset? Yes, through you, Mayor Cole, I think that's very wise and I think to have a separate uh, comment in the briefing notes would be um, important. Just to clarify, I did go and speak to the other sections of the city to ensure that we didn't have any plans for that car park or that if we did what they were and whether we needed to make a separate um, submission in relation to that. Um, we didn't have any plans in relation to redevelopment of the car park and so it was simply a matter of how does it affect the car park and engineering provided some clear comments on, on that. Thank you, Director. Um, councillors? Councillor Gonczewski. I'd just like to 
um, just get my head around the um, two additional stories, but 10.5 additional metres in height, and the interplay between then talking about setbacks in terms of stories versus um, actual height. And I was just wondering if it was possible to get some comparative um, sort of drawings in relation to some of the setbacks um, in comparison with what would be approved under the built form policy and what the proposal is? Yes, through you, Mayor Cole, we can put some drawings together. If, if the applicant um, doesn't have the time to, we can certainly do it. Um, just to point out, because the stories that are proposed are higher than under the built form policy, the setbacks that the applicant has proposed are often greater, um, particularly in the sensitive areas. So the setbacks ultimately would be greater in certain locations. And where they've been reduced in relation to the right of way, um, the internal water court easement, for instance, um, obviously the stories being higher would result in a lesser setback. But we can certainly draw those out, sketch those out and provide those to you so they're clearly illustrated. Thank you. I'd appreciate that. And I guess my other question just was around landscaping um, and um, where that would be, if I've missed it, my apologies, but where that would be referenced or whether that would be as per our existing or you know other policy um, mechanisms. Yes, through you, Mayor Cole, the landscaping requirements would be as per the R codes currently. Um, unless a commercial development, a, a standalone commercial development was proposed, in which case it would be as per the built form policy, um, and then hopefully as per the built form policy once it's adopted, once those provisions are adopted by the WAPC. Councillors, um, Director, I have a few questions. I'm happy for you to take them on notice if it helps, and I'll probably seek a meeting during the week just to go through this in a bit more detail. Um, and I'll let council members know if you are interested in joining me, um, because I do think there are um, a few things would be great to go through in more detail. Just in relation to those eight storeys, 31 metres height, I think it would be useful just for people reading the report to know up front that the 31 metres has, is additional height to what is a standard eight storey building. Um, I sort of had to read through the community consultation before that was very obvious, that information, so if that could be highlighted, that would be great. Um, in relation to um, the adjoining uh, residential properties where the recommendation is to condition three, story, um, three storeys in lieu of two, um, but with four being proposed, I just wanted to ask about overshadowing. I know this is an R160 and it's possibly unlimited. Um, but I also wanted to ask about what um, building form will be there. It looks like it might be car park. So I um, just have a bit of a concern about boundary wall versus open car park fronting a residential area and if it's possible to provide information on what um, the building form would look like from the neighbours' perspective. Um, if it was, for example, car park and open, then there would be other considerations. Um, I wanted to ask about the um, the car parking podium on the north side of the building and what that interface might look like from the um, Fitzgerald Street with the um, Italian Club side active at ground floor and then floors one to three look like car parking podium. So just wondering if the applicant could provide some more information about the facade of the building. I note that on the other side of the building that in some cases they have tenancies in front of the car park so that there's active frontage. I know that was critical at ground floor, but I'm just interested. Um, also, I note that one side uses underground car parking and the other doesn't, so I'm just interested in whether there's a, a reason for that. Uh, interested to know the um, square meterage of the Piazzetta open space. And just in terms, I know that we're not considering landscaping as part of the local development plan, but just interested to know from administration's perspective whether the um, building envelope provides sufficient open space to meet the landscaping requirements, deep, deep soil and canopy. Um, and just the local development plan does include quite a lot of detail about parking so I'm just wanting to 
clarify that this consideration of council is not about parking but about building envelope, but there is more detail there, so I just wanted to ask a question about that. And also it would be good to know um, where the water corp easement falls on the plans. Yes, through you, Mayor Cole, in relation to the car parking, um, the LDP does just propose additional height above what's set out in the built form policy to become a, a deemed to comply standard, um, as well as some changes to the deemed to comply setbacks, which essentially creates a building envelope that the building would need to sit in. That doesn't mean that the building um, will be that building envelope. Um, in all likelihood, it will be smaller than that, but it could also, they, an applicant could also propose something with a lesser setback and additional height um, because the development application will need to be considered separately um, on its merits at that time. So um, the, this LDP no, in no way binds um, that decision maker on the development application to what's set out here. Um, it's just another document that the decision maker will need to have due regard to. So. In all, in all likelihood, the envelope will be smaller than that, which will allow the landscaping to be provided. Um, within that building envelope, it's, it's really difficult to tell whether or not the landscaping could be met, um, given there's no detail provided at all about um, the roof spaces, the um, internal uh, light wells, the landscaped areas, the open spaces. So um, that will have to wait until the development application is, is lodged. Um, the applicant will provide all the car parking for the development on site. Um, and again, the configuration of that, they've provided some indicative drawings where they're currently sitting, which is what they're currently looking at doing. Um, but in no, way, in no way has that um, been decided yet by the owners. Um, and it's not part of what's being proposed. It really is just that two-page document that council will be determining. Um, all the other additional information is just supporting information which um, is not part of council's decision. It's part of something to consider, but it won't be something council locks away. Um, so hopefully that helps, um, and I'm happy to sit down and go through uh, all of the detail during the week. Thank you, Director. Are there other councillors that are interested in attending a meeting on this LDP? Yes, okay. Yes. Sorry, I have another um, question um, through you, Mayor. Um, just in regards to um, the proximity of this um, uh, potential development, obviously with Dorian Gardens at the back and Robertson um, Park across the road, I'm wondering what the mechanisms are that the city will use to um, ensure the amenity of the area as it currently is um, do not suddenly become um, points of complaint for the residents, obviously, of course, unless there are um, clear, um, you know, compliance issues, um, noise regulations being broken. So that's of particular um, concern to me, given the longevity of both those um, recreation areas. Yes, through you, Mayor Cole, there's nothing in this local development plan that will deal with that issue. Um, so it will be the ordinary processes that we go through with development by which we'll need to address each of those concerns um, and given the scale of what's proposed you're, you're right it'll be a, a significant issue that will need to be watched very closely. Through you Mayor Cole, I just also forgot to mention that the water corp easement is that right of way where the vehicles currently used to access the car park that's where the water corp easement is um, that's the extent of it I think it's oh, I can't remember how wide it is sorry three to five meters wide um, but essentially that hashed blue line that goes to the middle of the LDP plan. Thank you. Councillor Toppelberg. Sorry, just um, to confirm, we also had a comment from the gallery in relation to the Heritage Wetlands Trail, or the, the Heritage Trail and the connectivity between Dorian Gardens and Robertson Park, and that that easement in particular was seen as a key potential future avenue. If we could just get some commentary around that, and perhaps given that it was a submission that was made uh, on the LDP, perhaps if the submitter could receive that directly from the city, that would save him having to come and sit through this or watch it at home again next week. Councillors, any further questions? Okay, we'll move on to item 5.5, .5, 
which is 48 Agena Street, Mount Hawthorne, two group dwellings. This is a SAT Section 31 reconsideration. Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you. A uh, question through you to the Director of Development Services. My understanding of the way that the R codes are written is that the um, design principles are required to be compliant with, and one way of meeting the design principles is to deem to comply requirements. Given uh, in relation to the proposed garages, there's no question that they meet design principle 521 because it says as long as you set back four and a half metres from the primary street that that's okay. But in relation to 522, uh, it's been described as a loophole or a technicality where the deemed to comply uh, percentage of frontage doesn't apply because of the fact that it's set back. Does that preclude the development from having to comply with the design principle or does it just mean that they need to actually articulate a path to meeting the design principle? Because the design principle says the visual connectivity between the dwelling and the streetscape should be maintained and the effect of the garage door on the streetscape should be minimised, whereby the streetscape is not dominated by garage doors. My understanding is that that's what's required to be complied with, and the fact that it sits further than a metre back from the upper floor only means that it doesn't have a direct requirement to be less than 50% of the frontage. So if we can get some clarity around that, and also whether there is any uh, previous decisions that sat uh, in relation to design principles and then a development for, for technical reasons, not actually being able to meet any of the deemed to comply. Through you, Mayor Cole, if I can pass to the Manager of Development and Design to answer that. Through you, Mayor Cole, um, in regards to the setback of the garages, uh, Clause 5.2.1 um, sets out uh, setback requirements. Now, there's the deemed to comply pathway or the design principles pathway. Ultimately, it complies with the deemed to comply, the setback, um, so there is no discretion being sought there. Ultimately, one is no lesser than the other. One is more quantitative, the deemed to comply, um, compared so to the design principles. It was 522 that was of concern. Sure, sh sure. Um, but in regards to the setback of the garages, uh, the, so it strictly meets the deemed to comply requirement. In regards to the garage width itself, um, Clause 522 uh, sets out that where the garage is located in front of uh, or within one metre of the building. Now that's the qualifier. So given that the garage is set back at least 1.1 metres from the balcony, that provision does not apply. It's only where it is within the one metre. So just for clarity, the design principle doesn't apply my understanding is that the design principle applies, but the deemed to comply requirement is not a is not an applicable measure for for it. But the design principle still applies because the design principle still needs to be met. Is that am I incorrect? That effectively, yeah. Through you, Mayor Cole. Uh, ultimately, that provision does not apply to this. Um, where there were, if there was a scenario where the garage uh, was within that one metre of the building alignment and discretion was being sought and it did not meet the deemed to comply, you would then assess it against the design principles. The design principles do not apply in this instance. Has that been tested at SAT? Through you, Mayor Cole, uh, we can look into that. I'm not aware off the top of my head. Okay, that's, that's one question. And the other... I mean, we had some comments from the gallery. There's clearly, uh, I'm not a landscape architect and I'm not a horticulturalist uh, other than by hobby, but there's been some questions about the uh, arbitrary assignment of um, species and locations that, and questioning whether or not they can actually reach maturity. Can we get some independent expert advice uh, on that so that if we do decide to go to war on that, that we're not just having an opinion that we actually have advice about whether those species, whether the landscaping plan is able to achieve the canopy coverage that is proposed. The officer recommendation recommends uh, setting aside the decision and approving it, which means that our officers have said that they view that it's not, uh, we're not exercising discretion. There's a, maybe a difference uh, of opinion. Can we get, if we can get some expert advice on that so that we're not scrambling for it afterwards, that would be great. Through you, Mayor Cole, that can be confirmed. Uh, there is a section in the in the briefing report uh, around landscaping and the city's officers um, have reviewed the proposal and identified that there would be a conflict uh, based on the proximity of the, 
the tree species and uh, the proposed planting areas. Uh, with that being said, uh, it was the, the city's uh, or the administration's view that it's still capable of providing at least 25% canopy coverage, uh, depending on its location uh, of tree planting. Again, this can be confirmed through briefing notes. Councillor Lowden. Just following up on the landscaping query, in the previous time we saw this, I think there was 15% deep soil and 20.7% canopy coverage, and uh, there was discretion of council on that. But now that it's 15% and 25%, it is uh, deemed to comply. I just wanted to clarify why that was the case. Through you, Mayor Cole, just to clarify, uh, deep soil areas uh, do comply with the deemed to comply standard. Um, however, there is a shortfall in canopy coverage, uh, though it has been, or though it has increased from uh, twenty odd percent that you referred to up to approximately twenty five percent. That's still a shortfall because the deemed to comply standard in the built form policy is thirty percent. Uh, on that basis, uh, an assessment is required against the local housing objectives. So then under the local housing objectives, it's deemed permissible then? Is that uh, thrust then? Through you, Mayor Cole, ultimately a judgment needs to be made as to whether it satisfies those local housing objectives. Administration has undertaken that assessment and is of the view, as set out in the briefing report, um, that it achieves those local housing objectives and should be supported. Um, I note a verge tree is removed um, as a result of this as well, is, um, and no conditions were proposed around that either. Through you, Mayor Cole, uh, I will look into that and provide a response. It's not a particularly big tree, but... And sorry, the last one was just around the question from the gallery around the rear windows, which have now shifted three, I think three or four metres further back. Um, if you could provide a comment on that. Thank you. Through you, Mayor Cole, uh, in terms of the rear overlooking concern, uh, there are major openings proposed to the uh, upper floors. Uh, they relate to the master bedroom and bedroom four. Now, they are a minimum of 7.3 metres set back to the rear boundary, uh, required under the R codes, the deemed to comply standard, uh, is a minimum of 4.5 metres, so it does achieve that. Councillor Konczewski. Thank you. Just in relation to the um, elevations that have been provided um, of the dwellings in the garage. Um, could I just get some commentary in relation to um, the deemed to comply criteria in relation to the, the setback of the garage, um, which states that the um, garage must be complementary and subservient to the dwelling? Can I just get some understanding of how that assessment's been undertaken um, and how that criteria is deemed to be met? you, Mayor Cole, can I just get some clarification as to whether you're referring to design principles or deemed to comply standard? Um, well, the deemed to comply standard. C574. Through you, Mayor Cole, uh, ultimately the, there is an element of judgment in terms of whether the, the garage uh, achieves all of those matters, colours, um, scale and materials. Um, ultimately, uh, that view needs to be formed. In terms of colours, scale and materials, I guess the scale is of concern. You can tie that back to the width of the garage. Um, there has been uh, changes made through the mediation process uh, in terms of the materiality 
pulling the porch forward, um, providing that greater articulation. They also removed the internal boundary blade wall um, to allow that uh, greater depth as perceived from the street. So uh, all of those matters contribute to a judgment as to whether that deemed to comply standard has been met. Thank you. If, could I just, sorry, can I just clarify? Could I just get some, it would be very useful if that could actually be specifically addressed in the report um, because I think um, sim uh, just I recognise there is an element of judgement because the criteria isn't cut and dry, but it would be useful. Um, I guess specifically I'm concerned about um, complementary and subservient being the terms that I would appreciate some guidance upon. Thank you, Michael. Um So uh, uh, I can't. I won't make comment. I'll just ask a question. Part two of the R codes uh, approval process. 2.1.4 says all residential development is to comply with the requirements of the R codes, full stop. Approval under, the, under and in accordance with the R codes is required if the proposed residential development, A, does not satisfy the deemed to comply provisions of blah, blah. So given that we, I'm just trying, because my understanding is that the city's assessment and clearly the applicant's consultant's assessment is that that clause does not apply. My reading of the R codes is that there is a requirement to comply with the R codes and you are forced to a design principle code if you don't meet the requirements. Now, if those requirements don't apply for the deemed to comply, there's no discussion of that in the explanation process. And I guess what I'd like is perhaps uh, whether it be independent planning advice or legal advice prior to next week, because the issue of going of battling this out over whether or not species of tree can grow to a certain size is different as to whether or not the R codes actually apply on a critical element of the design. So if we can perhaps get advice, so for part two of the R codes that talks about the approval process, my reading of it as a lay person is that the requirement is to meet the codes and you have to get approval through one path or the other and if you don't meet one path, even if it's deemed not to apply, that doesn't preclude you from having to meet the, the principle of it. Clearly there's been a different view taken by our planners and the, the, the planning consultant that the applicant has engaged and we'd like to just get some clarity on that, please. Through you, Mayor that can be arranged. Councillors. Um, Manager, I just wanted to ask whether we could, if we're getting expert advice on landscaping, and I note that the, it is um, recommended to apply a condition to pr provide a new landscaping plan, whether we could have some advice on whether 30% canopy can be achieved, regardless of what the existing landscape plan says, given that there is a um, condition to provide a revised landscaping plan. So. Um, some expert opinion around achieving 30% canopy. Through you, Mayor Cole, that can be arranged, yep. And just um, really to follow on from Councillor Toppleberg's um, request, I think there are some points in contention um, around the applicability of the R codes or not. And um, uh, earlier we discussed the issue of building line in the built form policy not having a definition um, the definition of building under the R codes and then the applicability or not of 5.2.2. Um, and I think that really is a, a sort of point of contention that we really do need to um, flesh out and perhaps seek some independent advice. Thank you. Are there any further questions? No? Okay, thanks everyone. Lost my agenda. Yeah. Okay, as mentioned, 5.6 has been withdrawn, so we move on to 5.7 Amendment to Trees of Significance Inventory, Blackford Street Reserve. Any questions? Councillor Loden? Um, under the Greening Plan, I believe there's um, uh, an action to make this process simpler or finding an easier way to protect um, trees without having to go through a formal resolution of council. Um, I was just wondering on the status of that uh, activity. 
Through you, Mayor Cole, um, the administration was working on a project um, of the nature that you described and um, still looking to find, um, I guess, more streamlined ways to um, implement the policy, potentially through a policy amendment. Um, and so we bring that back to council. I think that's in the greening plan for the 2019-20 financial year, if I remember correctly. Um, so we'll be continuing work on that in the next financial year. Um, can I just ask a follow-up question? Because I think one of the issues was around the Arborist report and um, a request for a template to really streamline that and make that a lot more simpler so that if you do need to get an Arborist report, it could be criteria-based so that cost and efficiency could be part of the um, factor factored in. Is that also still under consideration? Uh, yeah, through you, Mayor Cole, the um, template for the Arborist report is live on the city's website, so people are able to use it. I think the Arborist report for this um, particular tree costs somewhere in the order of about $500. <coughs> Thank you. Any further questions? No? Okay. Item 5.8, proposal to name nine roads in Mount Lawley and Highgate. Any questions? Councillor Loden? Uh, just to follow up on the question uh, raised by... Uh, Dudley Meyer, um, around uh, that Aboriginal names or the, an, an Aboriginal name was overused, um, and if you could provide some commentary back on that. Through you, Mayor Cole, um, as was sort of described in the public um, question time, the advice that the city received from the Department of Aboriginal Affairs was that the name was overused. Um, it is used in a, in a cave down in Yelling Up. Um, and so regardless of the um, context with which the name is used, be it the spirit or the specific person that it's referring to, um, the Department of Aboriginal Affairs view was that it was not, it, it was not appropriate to have it used a second time. Um, given that the advice from um, Landgate is that they would base their decision making on the recommendations or um, support from the relevant Aboriginal stakeholders, the city feels that it's um, not appropriate to put that name forward to Landgate. Um, through you, Mayor. Um, may I ask whether that view of the Department of Aboriginal Affairs, which I understand is no longer, but that section has been integrated into another larger department. I can't remember the name of it, but it's about this long. Um, has the city challenged that view? I, I just don't. Um, I personally just don't accept decisions from public sector agencies like that. It sounds very arbitrary. Um, so, may I ask if the administration is willing to just accept that answer, or whether, at the very least, we can get some more information about the term overuse? Through you, Mayor Cole. Yeah, the city has um, attempted to contact the Department of Aboriginal Affairs um, since receiving that advice and, and I guess challenged or questioned whether it was appropriate um, but was consistently given the same feedback and so on that basis um, made a judgment that we were able to on on balance with the um, all of the laneway naming proposals were able to include um, a number of both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal names and so felt that we could proceed with the project. I'll put the rest of my comments on the record next week. Councillors, any other questions? Um, I also just wanted to ask um, manager a question about Piano Man. That was another one that was a local identity. I just um, thought the feedback from administration on the use of that name. It's okay to take on notice if you wish. Yeah. 
Sorry, Steph, I just wrote it down on my notepad, so I'm happy for you to take it on notice. Uh, sorry, just to clarify, you're um, requesting information on the feedback that the city has received from Landgate regarding that name? Yeah, just yeah, why it didn't make it through. Um, now, just in response to the question about consultation, I understand this did go through a rigorous um, process in 2015, but in response to the question about consultation from this point forward, do you have any further comment? So, through you, Mayor Cole, um, the City has undertaken this project um, over a sort of long time frame um, and conducted consultation initially to seek the, the names that we have before us today. Um, throughout the process we've engaged heavily with the Department of Abdur Aboriginal Affairs um, and Landgate and because of that Landgate has advised the city that no further advertising is required for this particular um, naming project that the city is working on. Um, going forward we're proposing that um, council endorse the proposed uh, laneway naming procedure which is um, consistent with the with Landgate's policies and guidelines and that would ordinarily include include upfront um, seeking of naming suggestions from the community and then a further round of consultation on the specific names and so that would um, absolutely be the the approach going forward um, just in this instant Landgate has advised that it's not um, required for the city to undertake further consultation. Councillors, any further questions? I have a, um, another question, which is, I guess, general in regards to um, some of the comments. And I just um, just refer to page 394. This goes back to my previous point about challenging some of the inconsistencies. Um, so page 394, road three. If I've understood this correctly, wherever there's a tick, it's been approved. Is that, is that correct? Can I understand that coding? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, where there's um, a tick, it identifies that the name would be um, suitable for shortlisting. Where there's a cross, there's been an issue um, through the consultation process with the relevant agencies, um, and so it's not supported to um, continue through the shortlisting process. So I just want to draw on the record, for example, the name Butcher, which is just such a common... Um, Noongar name, it's used all the time. So um, may I just ask, I mean, there are, there are numerous and perhaps I'd be happy to come and have a chat through some of these with the Mayor as well. There are numerous names throughout this list which are either widely used or are duplicated in, in the hundreds. Um, so I'm concerned and that's why I raised the issue about the term of... Um, uh, the Aboriginal woman's name, and I am concerned about the inconsistency and about why that one would be ruled out and why Budja would be put in based on the amount of duplication. So Budja has generally nothing to do with that laneway, albeit that it's a general term um, um, for the ground and the land. It could be used for the build this building anywhere else. So can I just ask the administration um, to um, include those um, thoughts um, and those comments that I've just made in any discussion you may have about whether we challenge um, government departments on their inconsistent or um, incoherent um, decision making. Councillors, any further questions? Okay, we'll move on to the policy aspect, which is item 5.9. Amendment to policy number 2.2.8, laneways and rights of way. Any questions on this one? Councillor Gondoshevsky. I think this is me being a pedant, but um, in the policy under section seven, naming, it still refers to policy procedure clause five, and I think the intention is that we're removing that. So that's just maybe a little strike through, maybe that we could do next week. Councillors, questions on the policy? Um, manager, I had a couple of questions. Um, I just wanted to clarify that Council's role under the road naming procedure is nothing. 
Through you, Mayor Cole, uh, that's correct. We're proposing that um, laneway naming submissions be dealt with at an administration level going forward. Um, this is the way that most other local governments in WA deal with naming requests, and it just means that we can expedite the process um, while still conducting the relevant consultation. Thank you. And I just wanted to ask about the road naming criteria and how that was developed. Through you, Mayor Cole, um, the road naming criteria is how it was developed based on um, a number of the requirements in the in Landgate's policies and guidelines, and um, through kind of expanding on those in the context of the city of Vincent, um, and recognise our um, other strategic documents or positions that would support Aboriginal naming and, and things like that. Thank you. Um, I was just also wondering whether there was a bit of crossover between criteria two and four. It talks about Vincent identities in, in two, Vincent identities including persons with historical connections and a pro, pro, proven historic association. And then four talks about pe persons who have served and have had a proven historic association with the area. So, oh, sorry, so that's, you must have served and had a, right. Um, I wondered whether two and four could sort of be merged. It's not really, you know, a major issue, but it's um, it just seems to me that um, that would tie in quite nicely with two rather than have a standalone criteria. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, happy to um, happy to consider that request. Thank you. Any further comments or questions? No. Okay. Um, the final planning item for the e this evening is the request for minor amendment to Metropolitan Region Scheme, Vincent Street, Other Regional Road Reserve, item 5.10. Questions on this item? No? Okay. Thank you, Development Services. Um, we have one engineering item, 6.1, tender number 563 of 18, Mount Hawthorne Lesser Hall refurbishment appointment of a successful tenderer. Any questions? Councillor Loden. I just realised I don't have any questions. <gasps> <gasps> no! Okay, I have questions. Um, <laughs> we make exceptions every now and then. Um, I have just wanted to ask about the construction time frame and approximate start date, noting that a tender has not yet been awarded, but if you could provide any guidance, and also whether the report could include the scope of works. Uh, through you, Michael, uh, we can certainly add that before um, uh, next week in the report, the scope of works. I've got a list of things that are going to be done, but we'll add that to the report for clarity. And also, I'll um, I'll check the anticipated time scales for start of construction. I know that we intended to complete this financially, but I, um, off the top of my head, don't know the, the uh, anticipated start date. Thank you. Um, will there be much disruption to the use of the park? Um, through you, Nicole, uh, we believe not. There was already some disruption with the construction of the toilets, so we're trying to avoid that. Uh, we're very keen for the contractor to access um, the hole through a different route, and uh, we'll work with the contractor to minimise that disruption. So we don't think it'll be significant. Thank you. Any further questions? Thank you, Engineering. On to Corporate Services, item 7.1, Investment Report as at 31st of December 2018. Any questions? Councillor Loden? Um, I note that we've uh, got increased um, amount of fossil fuels uh, in our investment mix there, um, and I was wondering, has administration worked out how much additional interest we have received as a result of preferencing a fossil, fossil fuel bank over a non-fossil fuel bank? Through you, Mayor Cole, um, we can do some high-level analysis, but it is quite difficult because, of, um, particularly in the past, the um, 
way that we change our investments around quite quickly. So we can certainly do some high level analysis on that. Um, but I think we would get more value out of it once we've revised the investment policy and started to consider those investments that really are fossil fuel free um, as opposed to the high level decisions we're making at the moment. Councillors? Um, Director, just to follow up on that, um, the report talks about sustainable platform doing an accreditation assessment on our practices and policies. And I just wondered if there was any update on time frame for that. Thank you, Nicole. Um, we are speaking with um, Sustainable Platform in the next couple of weeks, so we're just seeking out a bit more information from us. Um, but so far, the assessment looks very positive, so we should have something back to Council, I would hope, by the next meeting. Great, thank you. Any further questions? Okay, moving on to item 7.2, authorisation of expenditure for the period 14th of November to 31st of December 2018. Any questions? Councillor Harley? Just bear with me, 5.37. I haven't asked a question on this type of thing for a while, but five, sorry. Sorry, the end of um, the attachment 7.2, page 21. Um, image of Queen for citizenship ceremony. 194 bucks. What happened to the old one? Did it get stolen? Um, it gets updated every now and then as Her Royal Highness um, <laughs> passes just... through um, phases of life, <laughs> is my understanding. <laughs> And so it is a requirement like okay. we see every now and then on our coins where okay. there is a change. So it, I believe it's a requirement that we have the updated version of the portrait. Just asking because she looks very young in that photo, that's all. All right, so it wasn't stolen. We've still got the old one somewhere. It's archived. We've got 20 years of them. Thank you. I'll bag that when I leave. <laughs> Thank you. Further questions on expenditure? Um. I just was interested to know, uh, note that the um, latest expenditure on Bang the Table, the consultancy website licence has gone out. I don't have an issue with that. I just wondered at what point would we be doing a review on the, um, uh, I guess, on the impact of the EHQ website and, um, and its success or otherwise? Through you, Mercole, that will be done as part of the community consultation project um, and we'll need to make a decision on whether we remain with EHQ in September of this year. Thank you, Acting Director. Any further questions? Okay. Moving on to financial statements, item 7.3, as at 31st of December 2018. Any questions? Any questions? Okay, item 7.4. The City of Vincent Ordinary Election of 2019, appointment of Electoral Commissioner to conduct the election by postal vote. Any questions? Councillor Patakis? Um, through you, Mayor. Uh, have we got any indication from the Electoral Commission as to what um, form of um, marketing or advertising that they're going to be participating in to encourage um, increased turnout um, for voters so that they're fully aware of the election in place? Through you, Mayor Cole, we haven't received that information yet, but we can follow up prior to the briefing and provide more details. Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you. Uh, I note that our quote was based on a response rate of approximately 32,000, uh, sorry, 32%. It's a long time. Well, I don't recall the last time we topped 30%. Uh, we were in the low 20s, I think, low to mid 20s this time. Just if we can get some indication next week of how that would impact our quote if we were closer to 25% than 32, I'd be happy to pay for 50% turnout, but 32 seems at odds with turnout in Vincent over the last three or four elections. Go back and check. It's all online. Through um, you, Mayor Cole, yes, we will follow up on that. Yep, thank you. Questions? 
Um, look, I had a question in relation to the Australia Post Priority Service being an additional 4,900 and my understanding was is that at least for the return of ballots that we did have priority post at least for the last election and given that the Australia Post time frame on uh, postal service has significantly changed in the last I think two years now with I think local post not being guaranteed within a week um, I'm just querying not having that as part of the um, service with the Electoral Commission. Through you, Mac, yes, we will follow up on that. And this one is a little bit more outside the box. I acknowledge that what is proposed is in accordance with Council policy, but I just wanted to ask this question because occasionally um, residents and ratepayers do say, is there somewhere I can go and vote on the day? As it's, you know, and I just, um, I know that they can come and request a replacement ballot and fill out forms, etc. But um, is there any opportunity to, in addition to doing a postal vote, also looking at having the City of Vincent administration acting as a polling place on the day? I'm not sure if that's those two are in contravention of each other or. Well, that's just a question so that I can at least answer queries that come from residents every now and then. Through you, Nicole, we can follow up with the Electoral Commissioner and see how that impacts the quote as well, if that's possible. Any further questions? Um, I have a question in regards to um, governance over the, um, over the processes, and I'm wondering, um, and if you could take this on notice, please, when was the last time the Electoral Commission did a spot audit on any of our elections? Double checking of signatures, verifying that somebody who's been marked off the roll has actually voted, etc. And whether they, um, whether this is done um, routinely after each election, um, or whether it's just done on an ad hoc basis. Through you, Michael, we can get some more information on the Electoral Commission's um, controls around that and how often they audit it and um, provide that. Thank you. Councillors, any further questions? Okay, we'll move on to item 7.5, Council Recess Period 2018-19, receiving of reports, of which there was one. Any questions? Okay. Um, the next item is... 7.6, City of Vincent submission to Welga, Local Government Act Review Phase 2. Any questions? Um, look, I did have a few which um, I did discuss with Maluka prior to the meeting, but just for the benefit of the public record and for councillors, um, I was interested in whether the City of Vincent would be providing a, a submission separately to Welga, um, knowing that we're not always um, on the same policy position as Welga. I think that that would be valuable and if that's not the case, I would like to just flag an amendment that we do prepare a City of Vincent submission separate also to the Welga submission that goes direct to the department. I um, also had a question around um, attendance at meetings via technology, which is a, something that we'll all be heading to and I don't have an issue with supporting that, but just to perhaps note um, that we may need criteria in meeting procedures, so each individual local government could potentially deal with it that way, if that could potentially be considered. Um, the, re the recommendation from administration is compulsory voting on a four-year cycle um, just wanted to pull that one out, um, given that we currently have two-year elections with um, half of council up for election at one time. Um, also just wanted to clarify that in regards to direct election of the mayor being supported, absolutely, but discretion to change um, not being permitted where there is already a directly elected mayor by council. I hope that makes sense kind of speaking shorthand. Um, and I think that was mainly it. I did have a question in relation to the boundary change amalgamation proposal and the binding poll, whether that means that if you poll electors and they say 
you know, 49.9% say this and that that means that that's, that's binding and the elected members no longer have a say. And I think that was, that was it. Happy for you to take those on notice. Thank, Thank you, you. Nicole. We'll take those on notice. Thanks, Director. Any further questions? Um, next item is seven. Oh no, we've de dealt with seven point seven. So we say thank you, corporate services. We'll move on now to community engagement. Eight point one amendment amended use of Les Lilliman Reserve by Subiaco Football Club. Any questions, Councillor Gondoshevsky? Just in relation to Subiaco's request to increase their training days to accommodate an increased number of female participants in their sport and considering the next item on the agenda, um, just what strategies or conversations has the city had um, in relation to, uh, I guess, supporting um, this uh, increase in female participation in terms of access to training grounds? Through you, Mayor Cole, I need to take that one on notice. I'm not 100% sure. Councillors? Sorry, I'm... Um, through you, Matt. Am I missing something about specifically female in the recommendations? I'm not reading that. Okay. Um, sorry. Council Councillor Gontoshevsky's just mentioned specifically yep. about female participation. Can you point to the page. I think it's, and CO yep. is just pointing out, it's um, page 663 in the body of the report. Yes, yeah, sorry. The the, um, it, it notes that Subiaco requested an increase in number of training days um, to support increased the girls' teams, um, but that it was not considered appropriate. Page 663 at the bottom of the table. So my question is that it's um, why it's not been included in the recommendations given that that seems to be a factor we're being asked to take into consideration in support of this. So my question to the administration is, if that's a key factor, increasing the training days, therefore increased use of Les Lindemann, why it's not been included as a recommendation? So we can lock that in. Happy to put it on notice if... Through you, Mayor Cole, yeah, we'll take that one on notice. So can I flag an amendment to that then? Thanks. Amendment flagged by Councillor Harley on item 8.1. Questions? Councillor Kondrzewski? No. Um, um, Acting Director, I did have a question. I was a little bit confused about how this fits in with the leasing framework which is due to come to Council next month. Um, and whether, um, you know, where we're sort of looking at moving towards having leases or licence arrangements and why this is not being dealt with in the context of that framework. Apologies, Mayor Cole, I'll need to take that one notice as well. Thank you. Um, okay, any further questions? Okay, 8.2, an update on the notice of motion, motion from Councillor Susan Gondoshevsky, strategies to improve participation and accessibility by women and girls at City Vincent Sports Grounds and Associated Facilities. Any questions? Councillor Gondoshevsky. Um, through you to the Acting Director. Just in relation to the request for the health checks um, that was, I understand, was sent out on the 30th of October 2018, um, just what was the submission date requested from um, sporting clubs and who hasn't, who hasn't provided a submission to date? Through you, Mayor Cole, I need to take the order notice. Um, it would appear from the report that no club has applied for a grant um, and just uh, wanting to confirm that and whether any follow-up has been undertaken with clubs to establish why they have chosen not to pursue a uh, grant application after making an inquiry. Through you, Mayor Cole. Um, no, I don't believe that they have done follow-ups yet and I think there's some more scope for f um, the promotion of these particular grants. 
Um, just in the audit report of the facilities, um, it talks about that this report would be used um, in the um, construction of the 1920 Capital Works budget. Um, just uh, oh, save comments potentially, but um, it, how would that be possible? Uh, the, the audit doesn't appear to compare our existing counts of change rooms with any particular criteria or targets, so um, has there been an assessment undertaken of the suitability of the, the count achieved in the um, document provided? Through you, Mayor Cole, I need to take that one on notice. Um, and I note that um, there was also um, a uh, section of the, oh, I'm just going to get to it, sorry, that, that part three of the response to um, the, um, oh, hold on, let me just get to it, was also looking at the, uh, that noting that administration, it, sorry, part three of the response um, from the OMC on um, 24 July 2018 noted that administration would be investigating a range of initiatives that may further support increased sports participation by women and girls within the City of Vincent, including um, looking at um, sports ground fees and charges, rebates and, and other mechanisms, um, looking at existing programs at Beattie Park and Loftus, um, liaising with the Department of Local Government Sport and Cultural Industries and um, specifically investigating opportunities to attract sporting codes with traditionally high female participation um, through master plans and um, just uh, wondering what progress had been made on in relation to those investigations to date. Through you, Mayor Cole, uh, none to date has been um, taken on those particular items but will be provided in the next update. Um, and when, when is the next update scheduled to come to Council on this? Through you, Mayor Cole, I believe it's prior to the uh, budget in the new year, so it should be around April. I'll flag an amendment that, um, I mean, potentially an alternative motion, but I'll definitely flag an amendment um, that may um, note the works to date, but I'll, but request a further update to come to the um, March meeting um, that sets out the um, results of the um, health checks, um, more detail on the audit, and um, a specific reference to the investigations and that will be undertaken between now and the end of the calendar uh, financial year. Okay, any further questions on this item? No? Okay. Thank you, community engagement. We're now moving on to the CEO items. So 9.1, .1, information bulletin. Any questions? Councillor Lowden? Uh, just a question on the uh, development stats. Um, there's previously some details in there around the number of applications that uh, development services received. I think that's dropped off the report template. Through you, Mayor Cole, I'll need to take that on notice. Um, these were prepared before I came back, so I'll sit down with the team and understand the changes. I noticed that it was different. Um, it sounds like the number of DAs lodged certainly would have dropped off. And just the second one was uh, with the director returning from leave. Um, we had some discussions around the need to increase resources and that was a proposal potentially going into the budget and I just wanted to check if that was still the intent. Yes, through you, Mayor Cole. Um, I remember last year um, when we discussed this issue, we really hadn't established um, whether we had adequate resources or not because we'd had so many vacancies over the last few years. So um, it's nice to see that we've had a lot of stability in the last 12 months and we can really establish now um, whether there is a need or not a need for additional resources um, and what that would mean. Um, it's certainly something that we've looked at and it will certainly be part of um, the budget proposals. Sorry, Councillor Lowden, did you ask about 2017 DAs? 
No, I just uh, previously the report showed um, each month how many DAs we received and how many had uh, been processed and withdrawn and so forth. And, I mean, you can do the math yourself if you want, um, but it, well, I found it very useful because it showed a trend of where we're yeah. seeing increases or decreases in DAs. No, that's, I get it. Thank you. Any further questions on the information bulletin? Oh, Councillor Gondoshevsky. Sorry, this is just in relation to the... Um, uh, parking infringements. Yes, I'm trying to work out. Uh, it, there's a graph in relation to infringements issued by a fence, and the bottom two uh, columns or bars or lines in the uh, one of them is failure to display a valid ticket bracket TMZ or TMZ, and the other one is failure to display a valid ticket parking station. And I'm just interested in what the difference is. Um, it threw you to the Acting Director of Community Engagement. I believe one would be timed and not paid and one would be paid. Is that right? Because <laughs> one of them is failure to display a ticket and then the one above that is parking contrary to a sign or a limitation, which I think is that one. Through you, Mayor Cole, I'll need to take that on notice. <laughs> well, I had a crack. Don't know if it's right or not. <laughs> any further... Any... Time... Time monitored zone. Yeah. A parking station it was probably paid. Time monitored is time restricted. Well, you need a ticket in the... For example, in the Loftus Centre car park, you need a ticket but you don't have to pay. Um, any further questions on the information bulletin? I'll get the definitive answer for you in the council briefing notes. <laughs> okay, with the last um, item for the evening is 9.2, Inner City Council's memoriam, Memorandum. It's not a memoriam at this point. It's only just getting started. Memorandum of Understanding. And I just want to point out that the report is um, a public report, but the attachment is confidential. So if you want to ask specific questions on the attachment, we may have to go behind closed doors. So, Councillor Toppleberg had a question. Um, as a procedural... Like, can I just get an understanding of why the MOU is required? Is it required or is it just felt that in good faith it's a good idea for people to, to sign up for it? I mean, it, it's got a specified time frame, which I also found a bit odd, um, but why is there a statutory requirement for it? Because I know there are strict rules around local governments not being able to spend money outside of their local government area, etc. So is there a need for it? Is it required in order to be able to collaborate on some of these matters or is it just that it was felt it was good practice to have a document that we agreed to? Well, I'll start and maybe the CEO can follow if there's anything to add. Um, it is it is a non-binding agreement and I think that it's just basically to give the group purpose and to really say this is the strategic intent and this is the sorts of things that we would like to consider. So it's really more, from my perspective, good practice rather than uh, statutory requirements, certainly not required. And the other key... CEO, do you have anything to add? Yes, uh, through you, Mayor Cole. Uh, part of the uh, intent around the MOU relates to the new City of Perth Act, which does speak of the importance of the City of Perth uh, working with neighbouring central Perth uh, councils to pursue collaborative activities, um, transport, economic development, tourism, for instance, which aren't just confined to a local government's boundaries. Yeah. Um, and is the intent for the document to be signed by elected members or the CEOs? I ask that question because the, con the construct and the makeup of the people who are then party to it can. It's an interesting. Uh, it doesn't, from what I can see, and it's not specific to the document, but it doesn't actually call for it. Just says on behalf of. Uh, is it intended that it is elected members agreeing in principle or administrations agreeing in principle? And therefore, is it a requirement for one or the other to sign? Um, it's the the requirement is for elected members to sign the memo MOU. Um, 
Any further questions, so, Councillor Harley? Um, I don't have this in my late items that I can find. Um, can I just ask why the need for the confidentiality? I don't believe. I'm not. I don't believe it will remain confidential at this moment. Each inner city council is um, going through this process with their own council, and at the time that each council then independently um, endorses the MOU, there will be a public statement made um, at that point. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, just to make a comment. There's nothing confidential in the nature of the MOU, uh, but it is still subject to some further negotiation and finalisation, um, which means there could still be some um, final edits following each council going through their approval process. And so it will certainly be made public uh, in, the, in the immediate future. I raise concerns about that, but may I ask that the administration keep very careful um, notations about how we've reached our position um, and I ask you to do that because of our history between the City of Perth and City Vincent. There is not trust there, in my personal opinion, with the, um, with the City of Perth. So I may ask that the administration keep very careful documentation as to how we reached our decisions and, have, and be willing to have a rationale as for why we signed up for what we did. My other question is about who's going to be the spokesperson for this group. Um, I'll put the rest of my concerns on the public record um, next week, but I want to know who's going to speak on behalf of this group. Well, uh, we haven't actually appointed a spokesperson, and I don't believe that, you know, at, at this stage there will be a, a joint press release and um, that will go out from all of the councils that are involved. So there's no one spokesperson, but it is fair to say that a lot of coordination has been happening from the City of Perth. But at the last meeting, there was discussion about rotating that so that it's not seen to be held by one council and that the meetings will actually move to each council. So it is intended to be a partnership rather than a lead um, local government. So my final question is in regards to whether this is something um, that we need to consult our community on in any way. I'm not, I'm not suggesting we do. I just want to know from the administration's perspective, do you believe we need to go out and have a conversation with our community about what this MOU means? And I ask that given the amalgamation history, but particularly between the two cities. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, uh, the nature of the MOU is that it's legally non-binding and it's quite specific in the text that if there was any specific project, uh, initiative, um, form of cooperation uh, which was agreed under the auspices of this MOU, then it would need to go through uh, the normal approval process, either through council or through a public consultation process if it was anything involving expenditure or the, committing the financial resources of uh, the city, then it would be subject to all the usual um, approval processes. So my final question is just, I just want to clarify that at no stage will we have um, one of the appointed commissioners speaking on behalf of the City Vincent. Can I just ask that administration, are you in a position to guarantee that at no stage will an appointed commissioner or any other mayor or any other elected official from outside the City Vincent speak on behalf of our city? Um, look, I think the MOU is clear that we all represent our own interests and that we retain our own individual identities and decision-making processes um, behind this and that there is no intention for one person to become a spokesperson or the person that sort of sets the agenda that this is a partnership where there's mutual benefit and where there's not. It's, there's no obligation to participate at any time. It may be that a, a participating council chooses to put to go forth with certain issues, be it promoting tourism in town centres, for example, but on other issues may say, well, look, we don't wish to be part of this. So not, it's not, as a, as a complete document, it's non-binding, but it doesn't mean that you have to be in for all. It means you can basically see where there are similarities. And um, there's even some discussion about across the table where there are some similarities between the smaller groups of local government. So it's not intended to be a group, a block, identity acting on all fronts together.
Councillor Fatakis. Um, yeah, I mean, it's I don't know how to phrase this into um, a question, but um, has the um, I think it comes down to more um, looking at um, code of ethics or just operation. So has that been discussed? Um, I suppose my concern is um, council seeming to pass comment on other member uh, councils that, that are member to that MOU um, about um, decisions or lack of decisions or the particular standing on on issues, um, particularly in public issues. So, um, you know, that's that's one thing with with this is to whether there have actually been discussions about uh, coming to some agreement about um, you know refraining from you know public comment about the operations of the other member councils. Just to state that the usual code of conducts apply and that I think that the whole sentiment behind the MOU is that this is to, um, to provide an opportunity to work together where the individual councils see value for their own communities and it doesn't then require that to happen so that if at any point a, a council decides it's not in the interest of their community and they decide not to participate, then it would reflect very poorly on another council passing comment on that because that's one of the sort of tenets of the agreement between the councils. Any further questions? Yes, um, through you, Mayor, to the administration. Is it possible to provide um, councils with a list of any other MOUs that this council has ed entered into with any other neighbouring councils, apart from some of the obvious, or with any other um, councils that exist outside of our neighbouring boundaries, just so we can, I guess, put it into context um, inter council collaborations we may have been involved in before? Through you, Mayor Cole, yes, we'll uh, search the records and the archives to make sure we um, bring to Council's attention any other MOUs, um, either lapsed or current. Other than our interrelations on Welga, <laughs> Tamala Park Regional Council and Window Regional Council. Yep. Um, are there any further questions on the MIU or any specific questions on the attachment? Okay, no, all right, well that concludes the council briefing for tonight and I declare the meeting closed at 8.55. Thanks everyone.